Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Walnut Creek. Stand with us together and let's sing to the Lord this morning the praise of hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah. So please be seated. Who's in my family? Yeah, if you looked at a picture of ours, we'd certainly look different. We have two biological children. We have three adopted children. So certainly if you look at a photo, you see brown hair, you see dark skin, you see blonde hair. And certainly we do get weird looks, but the great thing is seeing the Lord work and do things that you never even dreamed possible. The call to adopt came out of intimacy with the Lord, just like our calling to plant this church. I'm the church planting pastor of Refuge Church in the Ortega community of Jacksonville. We've been here about two and a half years. It was a community that was very unreached, and being there, the Lord just began to kind of do something in our heart. We didn't set out to plant a church for foster and adoptive families. It really just happened. The Lord did it. A lot of our church has become people from this community who are fostering or who are adopted. So we share that in common. People are longing for community. And when you add the layer of taking on people and children from difficult places, it's not easy. It's not comfortable. I think the reason they've shown up here, there's a big closet full of diapers and shoes and strollers and car seats. And they see that and they come here to get a need met. Through that, they build a relationship. Next thing we know, they're in our church on a Sunday. And I think about the amount of children who come to our church who, if families didn't say yes to foster care and adoption, uh, those, those children would never hear about Jesus. They'd never hear the gospel. This is the calling that God has for us. And when people give to Annie Armstrong, you're able to support those who are on the front lines of gospel work. And people hear the gospel who would never have a chance to hear the gospel. Wow, what a cool church, huh? Uh, church started for people adopting and fostering children. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? Aren't you glad to know that you help support that? Already you do. Anytime you give an offering, uh, uh, some portion of that goes to help support a church like Refuge Church and lots of other churches. God is at work in this world and all around us. And in different states, uh, this one was in Georgia, um, there are church planning efforts going on all the time. And I hope in the next year, you're going to see a couple of new churches 
uh, planted in Parker County that are going to be our uh, sister churches. Uh, did you know that Parker County is the sixth largest growing area in the United States? Yeah, some of you say, yeah, we know. Uh, traffic, right? We have traffic and construction and all kinds of stuff going on. Sixth lar- fastest growing uh, in the United States. And so more and more people are coming to our area, and there's going to be some church planting efforts uh, in this next year. I hope by this time next year, uh, we'll have a couple of church planters working out of our local association. And uh, it's exciting. But uh, I'm glad God led these folks to start this church and to reach out to families that are fostering and adopting children. That's a unique need and an opportunity to spread the gospel, and I'm thankful. Thank you for supporting that. I want to welcome you to our service today. Hey, it looks like after the church work day, they just left all the stuff in the church. Why didn't you all put that in the burn pile, huh? Hey, today is a very great day. It is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Not this palm, that palm, right? It's Palm Sunday. This is the beginning of Holy Week uh, as we uh, observe Jesus' last week uh, in Jerusalem uh, that uh, turned out, you know, he was uh, wrongly accused, he was wrongly tried, he was convicted, he was uh, whipped, scourged, he was uh, crucified on a cross, and we all know what happened happens next Sunday, right? The resurrection, right? This is Holy Week, and today is the beginning of Holy Week. And so we are going to worship the Lord today, and we are going to remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem for that last week, and the people waved palm branches, and they shouted, Hosanna, and they, um, uh, they put their clothes on the dirt so that the donkey wouldn't have to walk on dirt. How about that? How often do you see something like that? We don't see anything like that. Jesus deserved it, and it shows uh, that Jesus is the Messiah of God. And it's a good thing because he is our Lord and our Savior. And so today I want to invite you, I want to encourage you, I almost want to beg you to worship Jesus and to celebrate his coming into Jerusalem to fulfill God's plan to save us from our sins. We needed it, didn't we? And we still need him every day. Welcome to our church, look forward to worshiping with you today, and uh, I hope you will sing when we sing, pray when we pray, you'll listen to God. We'll listen to God's word together, and then maybe someone today will come to know Jesus or uh, join the church or something. Maybe God has uh, a decision for someone to make today. Or maybe you have a decision to make in the quietness of your own pew and your own heart. Let's be open open to that today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then let's welcome each other. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and Uh, All that it means, we thank you so much that Jesus came and that he did all that he did, that he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and the crowds uh, worshipped him and cheered for him uh, as he deserved, Lord. And uh, Father, I pray that we would worship you today as you deserve. Uh, Father, I pray that you be with each and every person here Lord, some are here and ready to worship. Others, uh, they need some convincing. And others, Lord, just aren't feeling it. And Lord, I pray that as we worship you, you will minister to our spirits and that you'll speak to our hearts. Lord, may your Holy Spirit be with us today and do the work that only he can do in our hearts and in our minds. We love you today. We set this time Uh, aside for you, and uh, we pray that you would help us to put away any distractions or worries and to focus on you, and we know we'll be better off for it. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Let's stand for a moment and welcome each other. Find your way back to your seats. Join us and sing. Hallelujah. Amen. Come, Christians, join to sing. of salvation, the sacrifice he made at the wonderful cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss, and poor content. 
Any of the kids going out to Children's Church? Follow them. King of Zion. Rejoice, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he nations, sorry, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double, for I have bent Judah as my bow, I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword.
that passage that, that uh, she read is one of the prophetic passages that talk about what was going to take place on Palm Sunday. Not today, but the Palm Sunday 2,000 some years ago. I was uh, reading one of my textbooks for a class I'm taking at the seminary, and um, it's, it says, here's a way that you can pray. And it said, if you'll put the screen up for our prayer time, it said, uh, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And uh, we changed some of the words to make it easier to understand. But I was uh, amazed. I was thankful. Hey, we're already doing that, right? And uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, these are some things to include in our prayer time together and in your prayer time. Sometimes you may not know, hey, what should I pray about? How do I pray? This comes from the Lord's Prayer, and you can use this in your daily prayers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you had a plan to send Jesus. It was a plan that you announced through your prophets. Uh, it was a plan that Jesus perfectly carried out on our behalf. Lord, you knew that we could not save ourselves, but that we would need saving. And so you sent your son Jesus, God in the flesh, to, to, to do all the things that he did, including riding into Jerusalem on a colt. And the people praised him and worshiped him as they should, whether they completely understood what they were doing or not. Father, all this speaks to your plan, Lord, to your omniscience, that you know everything and that you cause everything to happen. And so this morning we praise you for being the great God that you are. We thank you for being a God who uh, has a plan, a God who uh, can carry out any plan. And we're especially thankful for this plan that you had. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We praise you for him and all that he uh, did and all that he will do. We thank you that he perfectly accomplished what you sent him to do. That he didn't miss a thing. And we praise you for that. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that was there with him. And that we thank you for the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent when he went back to heaven. Lord, this morning we confess our need for you. We thank you that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And not through our works and not through being perfect. But Lord, we are saved when we rely on the perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our Savior, and He is our Lord. And Father, this morning we trust in Him for our salvation. But we continue to, we confess, Lord, that we need You. We confess that we have sinned against You. And Lord, uh, each and every one of us at some point this week has sinned against you or against someone else and sinning against someone else is also sinning against you. So this morning, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us and help us to, help us to make right what we have done. Lord, continue to grow us and mature us. Help us to love the things associated with you way more than the things associated with this sinful and temporary world. Lord, continue to teach us to make us more like Jesus every day. Church, take a moment and express your personal dependence on Jesus 
and ask God to help you with a sin that you may be struggling with. Maybe even this morning, there's a sin weighing heavy on you. Would you confess that to the Lord and ask for his help? Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers of confession. Thank you for forgiving us of all unrighteousness according to your word. Lord, this morning we also want to say thank you. Thank you. Lord, you are good in all that you are and all that you do. Whether we understand it or not, Lord, you are good. And you are worthy of our thanks. Lord, every good thing comes from you. You love to give good gifts to your children. Lord, you watch over us. You protect us. You save us. You speak to us. You provide for our needs. You're there for us when we are down. Lord, you you minister to our spirits. Lord, you have taught us your ways, and your ways are right, and they're good for us. Church, take a moment and thank God for, for some different blessings in your life, big or small. Thank God. Lord, this morning we also bring our cares and our concerns to you. And Lord, we thank you that you have invited us to do so. Lord, I thank you that your heart goes out to us. You care about us. When Jesus was walking the earth, he showed us your compassion and your mercy. Father, thank you for being that kind of God. We thank you that you know our hurts, you know our struggles, and that you heal according to your will and purpose for each one of us. Father, we lift up those in our church who are uh, facing uh, treatments and surgeries. We pray for those waiting for test results. We pray for those who are struggling with chronic problems and illnesses and disabilities. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with mental health um, issues this morning. Father, we pray for those uh, elders in our church and our church family that just have a hard time We pray for those who are lonely, for those who are seeking direction. Church, take a moment and pray for someone you know that that needs healing, that needs guidance, that needs encouragement or comfort. Father, we continue to pray for uh, missionaries. Thank you for this family that has uh, adopted some children and for leading them to uh, start a church for families that are uh, working through adoption and uh, foster care. Lord, uh, we praise you and thank you for such people and uh, thank you that we get to help support them Uh, Lord, we uh, pray for uh, other missionaries in North America and 
more international locations, right here in our own state, Lord, I thank you that Southern Baptists and other groups have uh, good works going on to uh, meet human needs and to uh, provide spiritual direction, to share the gospel and to start new churches. We thank you that you are at work and you're at work all over the world. Father, uh, we pray for our country. Uh, Lord, we all are aware of the turmoil, uh, especially within our government, also within our culture, all the division and, and, and angry people. Lord, help us to know how we are to respond to such things. Lord, may we always be prayerful and to pray, Lord, for your intercession. Pray for you to intercede in these events. We pray that you would guide and direct those who are world leaders, those who are our government leaders. Lord, cause them to know the truth Lord, help them to choose to do what is right. Father, we pray that as we continue in worship and as we listen to your word today, uh, Father, help us to truly worship you, to honor you as you so much deserve. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Jesus was fully God. And fully man. And being that, as he rode in on the donkey to Jerusalem, and he saw the joyous crowds of people there, the Bible tells us that he set his eyes like flint towards Calvary, towards what he knew was ahead. Because he knew he had to pay the price for our sins. Let's sing about Jesus paying the price for our sins. still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed in white as snow sin had left a crimson 
stain he washed in white as snow he washed in white as snow he washed in white as snow And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet. And when he had said these things, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Because that Sunday he came into Jerusalem and then we celebrate Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, um, next Sunday, not because that's when we meet, but that's when it happened. It happened on a Sunday, the first day of the week. And why do we worship on Sunday and not Saturday? 
because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. The first day of the week, Christians began to worship on the first day of the week because that is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And Christians, are, of course, are focused on Jesus Christ, and rightfully so. And so, uh, I don't know what you have planned this week. I've looked at the weather. I've thought about the assignment that I have due this week. Uh, there are lots of things. We, we've got work. We've got uh, school. We've got different things going on this week. But I don't want you to miss the importance of this week. This week in 2024 is really kind of an ordinary week, except we are remembering, we are reliving, we are celebrating the events, the direct events that led us up to Jesus' death on the cross, which was for us. He didn't deserve that. He didn't owe that. You and I did. But he did it on our behalf. And we look to and celebrate the resurrection. Folks, let me put this in perspective. This week, however so many centuries ago, this week was the most important week in all of human history. Everything that ever happened before and everything that happened after and is still happening and will happen, it all came to a pinnacle this week so many centuries ago. Now you may think, some, if I asked you, what are some important weeks in history? What are some important days in history? We think about... Uh, the start of wars, the end of wars, the election of presidents, the beginning of nations. Yes, those are important. But what Jesus did 2,000 some odd years ago is absolutely the most important thing that has ever happened. It's the most important event that ever happened. Now, the world doesn't get it. The world doesn't see it. The world doesn't accept it. But we do. We do, and we want to celebrate it this morning. And so we are going to begin uh, the most important, remembering the most important event in human history. This is much better and more important and more exciting than if the Cowboys actually won a Super Bowl. It pales in comparison to something like that. I wish that I could communicate to you how important this is. When we get to heaven and we look back and we understand everything that God wants us to understand, we will understand that that week is the most important week in human history. And this week, we remember, we relive, and we celebrate Jesus and what he did for you and me. This morning I want to obviously talk about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. The triumphal entry. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, it was a moment of triumph. It was a moment of honor. It was a moment of celebration. Because it was... Jesus, after all, and because it was the, un, the, the intense unfolding of God's plan from the very beginning. It was the intense unfolding of God's plan to save sinners like you and me. And so this week is ever so important. I want to read this passage from... Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And um, I'd encourage you, invite you, um, twist your arm, if I could, to get your Bible out, your phone, your tablet, whatever you read the Scripture 
on these days. And follow along with me. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to uh, Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, this comes from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. So I want to focus on this first part of the passage uh, to begin our time. And uh, I want to point out some things that we have that we can learn about Jesus. Now, some of you may already know these things, and some of you may already know these things, but you forgot. So I want to help remind you. And some of you might be hearing this for the first time. But I want to show you some important things about Jesus in this passage. The first thing I want you to see is Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He was not just a prophet. If you turn um, to verse 11 in that passage, uh, verses 10 and 11, in verse 10, the people were asking, who is this? And in verse 11, the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And I want to tell you that uh, he is more than that. That's what the, the people did not understand what Jesus had come to do until later. And their conclusion was he is a prophet from Nazareth. They just couldn't understand it. They couldn't conceive. They couldn't put two and two together to figure out who Jesus is. Some people understood, most did not. And they thought that Jesus was a prophet. But I tell you that the Scripture tells us that Jesus is more than a prophet. Jesus is God. Now, some people will say that Jesus is a prophet like Muhammad, like this one or that one. No, sir. No, ma'am. Jesus is God. The Bible presents the Godhead as God the Father, Jesus, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one. Jesus was not just a good man. He was not just an influential person. He was not just a prophet. Jesus is Lord. He is God. And He showed us even in this short passage. Notice there in verse 2, He sent His disciples to go and get this colt. And... Um, and, and he shows his omniscience. I hope it's a big church word, theological word. It just means that he knew everything. God knows everything, right? Nothing slips his attention. He misses nothing. God knows it all. I've known some people that think they know it all. But God really does. Amen? I'm trying to keep you all awake. Some of you are just like, out. Jesus is omniscient. He knew. He knew the scripture, of course. And he knew about the colt. And he knew what the owners would say. And so would we, right? If somebody took your car, you'd be like, why do you need my car? No, that's not exactly how we'd put it. And if somebody said, well, the Lord needs your car, you'd say, we'll see about that, wouldn't we? I mean, this is a weird thing. But Jesus had it all figured out. He didn't go ahead and make arrangements, buy the colt, 
tell the guy what to say. Jesus knew that this was going to happen. He knew, and by knowing, he caused it to happen. He is omniscient. He is God in the flesh. He's no mere prophet. He is God in the flesh. also want you to see that Jesus is the Messiah in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The Bible in the Old Testament uh, speaks of the Messiah, that God would send the Messiah, the promised one. The Bible tells us over and over in the Old Testament that, that God would send this Messiah. And Jesus is that Messiah. Now, the Jews, God love them, they don't believe the Messiah has come yet. Christians believe that he, in fact, has come, and he is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the promised one of the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Now, let's go back to the colt. He says in verse 2, Go into the village, maybe you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Can you imagine those disciples? You know, this isn't the first time he's asked them to do something weird. Remember he asked Peter, go fishing and get our taxes out of the fish's mouth? What? I mean, I'm sure by now the disciples are like, what's it going to be today, Lord? I mean, there's so many weird things that Jesus, if you think about it, the Bible has some weird parts to it. It's because Jesus is God and he can cause these things to happen. But so they, they went. Let me just remind you, when Jesus tells you to do something, you, you go, right? You go. And they were used to it by now. And he tells them what to say. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And so that's what happened, and that's what they said. And they got a colt, and they brought it to Jesus. Now, this is the fulfillment, verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. The prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament. You can look it up. It's in there. It's not one you probably read real often for inspiration or devotional reading, but it's in there, and it's important. God has it in there for a reason. And the next section of Matthew 21, verse 5, is the text of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, quoted Zechariah 9.9, 9, Say to the daughter of Zion, this is talking about Jerusalem, Israel, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now this prophecy had been made well before Jesus had ever come. Centuries before Jesus had ever come, and yet Jesus is fulfilling Zechariah 9.9 perfectly. He is the Messiah. He is the perfect fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Now, I want to uh, just make a point here that Jesus in this coming, when he came uh, to earth and lived among us, God in the flesh this first time, he came as a humble servant. Amen? He came as a humble servant. He didn't ride a white horse. Okay? He didn't ride a white horse. Now, typically, when kings would come into Jerusalem after a, a victorious battle, they would ride in with people waving palm branches, putting their clothes in the street, um, and uh, the, the king would ride in on a white horse. But Jesus, this first time, didn't come in like that. He probably could have sourced a white horse. I mean, if he can source a colt, he can source a white horse, right? But Jesus chose the most humble of animals, and he rode in on this donkey. Why? 
Well, first of all, because the Bible says it is. Right? Just that simple. And the second reason is, it is consistent with his humility. He came to give himself for those who would believe. He didn't come for himself the first time. He came for you and for me. And so he came in humbly, setting an example for us. He came as a suffering servant, according to the Scripture. And so he rode in on this donkey, I'm sorry, this colt, and um, the disciples brought the colt to him, and they put their garments on the on the donkey, sorry, colt, on the colt. I don't know my donkeys and my colts very well, okay? Let's look at, look at verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting. Hey, folks, this was no typical Baptist event. They weren't out there, you know, with their eyes closed and their mouths open like some of you right now. These folks were shouting. They were waving palm branches. Yeah. And they were throwing their clothes on the dirt. How many of you do that? Anybody do that? You know, their streets were a lot nastier than our streets because the animal's exhaust was in the street, all right? The streets were made up of all kinds of filth and sewer and animal exhaust. But to, but to honor Jesus, they threw their clothes. Jesus was such an honor that they threw their clothes on the nasty street. And the people were shouting and waving palm branches. You know, the, the, the practical side of me wonders... Were all the streets, were all the trees in Jerusalem bare? Don't you got to know? Wouldn't you want to know? I mean, did you go to Jerusalem? What happened here last week? I don't know. But folks, these people were laughing and, and they were shouting. They were so excited. They believed their Messiah had come. And so they didn't have confetti cannons like they do at sporting events. So they had palm branches. And that's the best they could do. They waved these palm branches. It was a way to make, uh, to make some noise, to, to celebrate, to honor Jesus as they should and as we should. Now, so they treated him like the victorious king that he is. And so... Uh, they also shouted. They shouted. And what they shouted is extremely important. Now, if you were just reading this to get through your daily Bible reading, you would just kind of, you know, run over it, run through it. But let me call some attention to it. What they were hollering out is not something that you and I would holler out. He was holler, they were hollering out, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Now that's not what we would yell. I don't know what we would yell. But this is what they yelled, and it's full. It is rich in meaning. And let's look at it. So what they are saying comes from... You guessed it, the Scripture. This Hosanna, Son of David, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, comes from Psalm 118, verses 25 through 26. They knew the song. They were yelling song lyrics toward Jesus. And this is what it says. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
we bless you from the house of the Lord. You may say, well, that doesn't sound quite the same. Well, it's because it was in Hebrew. <laughs> it was in Hebrew, and, and there's some translation stuff going on here. But the first thing that they said was, Hosanna! What a strange word. You, if you've uh, been to, uh, well, if you've been to some services where they're a little more expressive and free, and they'll say, Hallelujah! Right? Well, Hosanna's like that, but not. People would yell, Hosanna! And it was a, it was a, it actually has a, a meaning, Hosanna. It's not a word that we use. We probably should. We could. But Hosanna means, I beg you to save. That's what Hosanna means. So when they are hollering out, Hosanna, they are saying, we beg you or I beg you to save. Or another way you could understand it is, uh, please deliver us. They weren't just yelling out some word that nobody knew or understood, some churchy word. They were asking Jesus to save them to deliver them, and they were doing it. Whether they understood it or not, they were, they, were, they were yelling the right thing because that's what Jesus came to do. The Bible tells us that, um, that he told, the angels told the shepherds that God was sending a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. Jesus is the Savior. He knew that you and I would need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. And so when they were yelling, Hosanna, they knew what they were saying. They were saying, I beg you to save. That's what they were saying to Jesus. They recognized Him as a Savior. Please deliver us. Now, Jesus came to deliver people from their sins. What they were looking for is for Jesus to deliver them from the Romans. They almost had it right. Jesus does save. Jesus does deliver, but not from any government. But more importantly, Jesus saves us from our worst problem, and that is our sin. Hosanna! I beg you to save. Please deliver us. Then they said, Son of David! That's kind of a weird saying, isn't it? Son of David! Why are you talking about Jesus' daddy out here? Why is that important? Son of David indicates that they were recognizing Jesus as the Messiah of Old Testament prophecy. The Bible tells us that, that uh, the Savior would come through the line of David. That he would be a descendant of David. And so, when they say, Son of David, they are recognizing that Jesus is a part uh, of the lineage of David, which was required of the Messiah. So they were, they were, whether they completely understood what they were saying or not, they were affirming that Jesus is the Messiah. And he is the Messiah. Son of David. David was the king in the Old Testament. And Jesus, um, his father, of course, was God, right? Y'all do know that. We just did Christmas, all right? His mother is Mary, and through Mary's lineage, is the, the, they are the descendants of David. Wow. Did you mean all this stuff came together by chance? No. This is the fulfillment of God's plan. Now, there's another thing that he said. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is he saying there? He is saying they are praising that Jesus had come from God. They recognized that Jesus had come from God. They were hoping he was the deliverer from God. And he is, and he was. He 
wasn't the one they were looking for. They wanted someone to deliver them from the Romans. But Jesus was there to deliver them from something more important, which is their sin. But by saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they are recognizing that Jesus is from God. In fact, he is God. Emmanuel, God in the flesh. You ever, you know what a one-upper is? Y'all know what a one-upper is? A one-upper is somebody, if you talk to them, they've always done that or had one that's better than yours, right? Are y'all with me, a one-upper? If you've got a story, they got a better story. If you bought something, they bought it a long time ago, and theirs is better than yours. Do what? And they what? Oh, and they, they bought it much cheaper than you did. Yes, absolutely. Nobody likes one-uppers. This is a situation where the one-uppers had it right. Because not only did they say, Hosanna, son of David, blessed he is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said, Hosanna in the highest. When I read that, I thought, that's a one-upper. That sounds like a one-upper, doesn't it? But they're saying, Hosanna, God save us. But they're also saying, Hosanna in the highest. And what they are doing there is they are invoking heaven's blessing on them and the salvation that the Messiah was bringing. It was a a way of multiplying what they were uh, asking for and hoping for to the highest level. Hosanna in the highest. Save us now. Deliver us. And so they were emphasizing their desire to be saved. Hosanna in the highest. Now, someone has kind of translated this so that we could kind of understand what it may have sound like, sounded like to them. Listen to this. This is what they said. Save us, our Messiah, who comes to fulfill God's mission. Save us, we beg you, as you take your rightful throne and extend heaven's salvation to us. Amen? So these words sound unique and foreign to us, but to them, that is what they were saying. Save us, our Messiah, who comes to fulfill God's mission. And so all these things that they're saying about Jesus is true. They may have been short-sighted, focused on the Romans, but whether they understood it or not, they were giving Jesus the praise and recognition and affirmation that was true and right of him. Now, in verse 10, it tells us that the whole city was stirred. All right? The whole city was stirred. So Jerusalem... At this time, around the Passover, it would swell to over a million people in Jerusalem. There were lots of people there, and they were hearing about this guy coming in, what, the Eastern Gate, uh, on a colt, and the people were waving uh, 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 palm branches, and they were throwing their clothes in the road, and they were shouting words Affirming Jesus as the Messiah, word gets around in a small town. You know what I'm saying? And so people were asking, people were there for Passover from all over the world. And there was a lot of talk, you know, who is this? What's going on? Some people knew, some people weren't sure. Some people just made stuff up, I'm sure. But the conclusion of the people was, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. Galilee. I've already told you that he is more than a prophet. A lot of people will say, all right, Christians, I'll give you that Jesus was a good man and a good 
teacher. Don't settle for that. Because Jesus is much, much more. He is the Messiah, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He is God, and he is the conquering king. Now, the scripture tells us in Matthew that he came riding on a colt. So this is a, a little small, about the, a little bit bigger than my golden retriever, I guess. A small pack animal, and Jesus was riding it. And I'm sure the animal, you know, kind of struggled a bit. And it's really no way for a king to come. Why didn't they get a horse? Could have called an Uber and asked for a horse instead. But when Jesus comes on the day of the Lord, he will not be riding a colt. He will not be riding a colt. The first time he came as suffering servant, the second time he comes, he will come as conquering king. He won't be riding on a donkey. He won't be humble. He won't uh, be there to suffer. When he comes the next time, he will come in power and glory. And he will come to destroy his enemies. I want to conclude with Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. John the revelator, the one who uh, wrote down the revelations that God gave him about the end times, look what he says that he saw, that God showed him. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. This sounds like a different coming, doesn't it? It's the same Jesus. He just came humble the first time to fulfill God's promise and God's plan but the second time he comes he's going to come to judge and destroy his enemies makes war his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Hey, I don't know how this is all going to exactly work out, but he's definitely going to be on a white horse. And it could very be that some of us will be riding with him. You talk about your ride or die. Huh? Oh, let me continue. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings. And Lord of lords. Amen. So, Harold, go back to verse 11 if you would. And behold, a white horse. A colt served its purpose. Next up. The white horse symbolizes victory and purity and holiness. So when he came the first time, he was lowly, humble, a servant. He rode on a colt. At the end of days, the day of the Lord, he will come again, but he will come in power glory and victory 
riding a white horse. I want to encourage you this morning. Make sure that you're on the Lord's side. Because the next time he comes, he won't come to heal and to forgive. He won't come in his wrath. He will come in his power and his judgment. He will pour out God's wrath on sinful human beings as they deserve. Are you on the Lord's side? This morning we begin the most, uh, we begin remembering celebrating, affirming the most important week in all of human history. You say, well, what do we do every year? We don't do it. some things every year, right? We do it every year because it's that important. It's that important. And next Sunday is even more important. And so, I don't know what you thought about Palm Sunday when you came, but I hope you have a better idea about Palm Sunday even now after worshiping and praying and reading God's word together. Palm Sunday is a great day. They may not have really understood what they were doing, but what they were doing was right. And we know from the scripture what we're doing. We ought to do it even more enthusiastically. God had a plan, and this is God's plan going down. Thank God for his plan. And let me just say in closing, his plan was not to give us a holiday or a week or a day to throw lawn clippings in the the aisle. This was all to save us from our sins. We are sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. And this was God, this is God's plan to save us from our sins. You may think your greatest need is this or that. Your greatest need is for a Savior. That's what God knew that, and that's what He sent us, because He knew that was our greatest need. And so for someone, it might be that this. Holy Week is the most important week in their life. They've never understood it like they do now, and they want, they need to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. Here's a little thing I've learned, and that is that people are more open to coming to church on Easter Sunday than any other any other day in the Christian in the in the year. More than Christmas, more than any other time of year. And so I want to encourage you. Invite your family and friends to come next Sunday. Amen? And take advantage of that openness. For some reason, people feel an obligation. They feel uh, some tension. I need to be in church on Easter. For whatever reason, take advantage of it. Invite them. Ask them to come with you. Come sit by me. And let's uh, celebrate Resurrection Day together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll have our invitation. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for all that we've heard and learned this morning. Father, may we love and appreciate Jesus even more because of of this morning. Thank you for your plan. And Lord, we look forward to seeing people repenting of their sins and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. We look forward to all that this week means, and we look forward to Resurrection Sunday, 2024. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be down front to receive you. Larry's going to lead us in a closing song or an invitation song. Let's stand together. If you have a, a prayer need, if you have a you'd like to make a decision this morning, you come. We'll wait on you.
Oh, come on. That's not a foul. Oh. Wings are ready. Hey, uh, let, me, let me ask you something real quick. Yeah. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay. Hey, um, asking for a friend. Mm -hmm. What would a person's general thought be about scheduling or doing something on, 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 a, on a Sunday? I think, uh, generally speaking, most people like their Sundays to themselves. But asking for a friend. Yeah. What if there was something special about the Sunday, generally speaking? Generally speaking, it'd have to be really special. I mean, like a, like a showstopper. Right, right, right. So what if someone was raised from the dead? I mean, would, would that be showstopper enough? What's well, bigger than being dead and then not being dead? Right. Right. What what if said person was the son of God? Go on. And the miraculous act is through him he could save you from save your... Save you from my what? From your... Sins. Oh. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend, do you think a friend would like to go to something like that on a Sunday morning, if invited? Tell your friend mm. that uh, if he doesn't invite somebody to that, he's probably not really a friend. Right. Right? Right. 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 Hey, <laughs> I'm the friend. It was me the whole time. And the Oscar goes to Meryl Streep. I love her.